Welcome to the monthly truck stop webinars. They're presented by the Motor Carriers Insurance Education Foundation. These webinars are presented the second Thursday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. These webinars are presented as industry updates for information purposes only and do not qualify for state CE credit. If you're seeking state CE credit, email our office at trs at ibci.net because we do provide 12 hours of state CE credit each year also for members of the Motor Carriers Education Foundation. As we go through these webinars, if you have any questions, type them in the chat window and we'll answer them when time allows. Uh, if not, uh, we will email you answers. And if there are questions uh, later, we email and there's such a nature, we will attempt to share that with everybody. Also, if you have problems with uh, hearing us or, or uh, other things, also chat that in the uh, chat window and or call our office at 800-741-4084. I asked uh, a, couple, a year ago or so, we did some work with Sandy concerning IFTAs, and I learned a lot from that presentation. Which recently, I've had a, a situation come up where I've had a couple questions asked us and asked the foundation and about now with some of the new electronic log devices, some of those manufacturers are uh, saying that they can also track the miles and track the IFTA reports. And we're finding that now what's happening in this part of the business is that we, the policies that are based on premium, based on miles, based on if the reports, those if the reports were done maybe with a different accounting of the miles than now it's being able to be produced by the electronic log devices that also produce if the. So Rich Brim uh, called him up and we talked about this and we thought it's time again to uh, contact again with Sandy. I asked her to talk about those specific questions as well as giving us the updates and more detailed information. And to that end, I would introduce you to Rich. Rich Brim, will you take it over from now, introduce Sandy, and uh, take it from here. Thank you, Tommy. Yes, I agree. This is important information from an underwriting perspective. We always learn a lot from Sandy. We gained a lot previously, and in just prep for today, we've we've learned all the more of, of some elements that may be confusing as you as underwriters are trying to connect the dot, you as an agent are trying to bring together information and, and people may think it's false or misleading and it's not, it's just not clearly understood. I believe Sandy is gonna help us identify some of the potential problems that are inherent, but most specifically, let's understand what we have before us and, and accept it for what it is. Sandy Johnson comes Hails from the uh, northern climate. She comes from um, um, from Canada, and she started out in the trucking industry as an IRP prorate supervisor for the government of Alberta. She left government in '84, started a transportation service bureau, and in '93 she sold that business and went to work for a large enterprise as the national manager of tax and licensing for Rentway Truck Rental and Leasing, which is a division of Trimac. Many of you recognize that name. In '98, Sandy is in uh, since 98 she's been the managing director of north star fleet solutions located in calgary alberta and although it's primarily a truck service bureau north star also sells software including an irp fee calculation program and an online fuel tax reporting system as well as their gps smart audit program so over the years she's made it a priority to know about this industry the people that are involved and working with everything from the drivers to the company executives and government officials. She serves on many committees and she's currently the chairman of the IFTA IAC. She writes a monthly fleet tax compliance column for Truck West Magazine and you can see her articles on LinkedIn, that's where I follow her and see a lot of this, as well as tracking her on her website which is www.fleettaxpro.com. She does like to have fun. She likes to have uh, some fun through her hobbies of singing and laughing with her peeps, as she says. And at this point in time, I'd like for us to gain some knowledge. So Sandy, I'm gonna turn it over to you, thanking you in advance. Thanks very much, Rich. Um, I'm just gonna go back here a little bit and uh, just say thanks again for having me here today. And I hope that this information that I'm providing, uh, I've tried to make it as relevant as I can. And, um, uh, Based on my experience, um, this, this is uh, what I came up with. So I'm known as a fleet tax professional. So I like to um, 
uh, you know, there, there are lots of people like me. They work for service bureaus or they work internally in, in companies. But not every company um, handles, uh, uh, takes, takes IFTA as seriously as fleet tax professionals do. And sometimes that's where we run into, uh, into some problems. So um, today we're going to talk about IFTA and IFTA miles. And are the IFTA miles reported the actual distances traveled? That's, that's one of the questions I think um, that uh, Tommy alluded to is that, you know, we're finding out that now with uh, GPS distances um, being reported using, through the electronic logging devices that maybe um, which, what, what, are, what are actual distances anyway? And are the jurisdictions auditing the distances reported by the carriers? I think sometimes we get it in our brains that, um, that governments, uh, you know, they're going to audit and make sure that everything is right. But that's not necessarily the case. And then are GPS distances collected by ELD systems valid for IFTA? That's another question that we need to answer today. Hmm. So IFTA distance and insure. So you're here obviously to learn something. It's an educational uh, forum. So we wanna make sure that insurers are understanding IFTA distance collection. Um, what happened before ELDs and what, what, what kind of distance can you expect after uh, the implementation of the electronic logging devices? If the distance reports used by insurers to establish premiums, now, now maybe you know in order to get what you need, you have to know what to look for and potential problems. And then you also need to know what you're looking for to help the clients get you what you need. So let's just start by talking about what is IFTA anyway and why do we have it? IFTA is the acronym for International Fuel Tax Agreement and it's an agreement between jurisdictions to collect tax from their carriers and distribute that tax amongst all the jurisdictions who act as agents for each other. So what happens is if you are a carrier that operates in a single jurisdiction and you're not required to have IFTA because if you never leave your base jurisdiction, all the, the tax that you pay at the pump when you fill that vehicle with fuel, all the fuel tax, that base jurisdiction receives the entire benefit of the taxes collected. So again, if you're filling up at a pump, you're paying tax at the pump, just like a car and you're, that, that entire tax benefit goes to that jurisdiction. But if you travel in multiple jurisdictions, tax rates uh, change. So for example, the tax rate in California is not the same as the tax rate in Nevada. So if the makes it possible to net that tax. So even if you buy fuel in California, but you consume it in Nevada, you pay the consumption rate, less the tax paid rate. And that's what IFTA does. And it's all done in the interest of fair and equitable tax distribution and to aid in commerce. So that Nevada that has a lower tax rate um, will, will get their share, you know, like or California will actually get their share because if you had to pay, if, you're, if you were going to, uh, shop around for fuel, you wouldn't buy it in California because of the high tax rate. You'd buy it all in Nevada. So it's really a very clever system. So right now, before I say anything, you guys will probably laugh at me because I'm Canadian and in Canada, we say decal. We don't say decal. Just <laughs> like we don't say, just like we don't say deal aware or we don't say delicatessen. We say a delicatessen. So we saw, we say decals. So if to annual license and decal, so carriers um, with qualified vehicles, and that means vehicles that weigh 26,000 pounds or more, or there are a few other definitions, three axles when used in combination, or three axles regardless of weight. And they apply to their base jurisdiction for a license and decals. And if the decals are like a credit card. So if you are from California and you go into Nevada and you have 
um, an if the decal on your truck, then they if that Nevada law enforcement knows that they're going to get their share of tax. So it's just like you're going in there and they say, yeah, that's, I know I'm going to get my money. Okay, so what happens then is all the IFTA distance is collected and it's married with the fuel data to create an IFTA return. So they calculate consumption by jurisdiction and then that IFTA return gets filed with the base jurisdiction on a quarterly basis. So four times a year in April, July, October, and January, those returns get filed with the base jurisdiction. And from that point on, then the base jurisdictions, they add up all the returns from all their carriers and net out the funds, and then it gets all divided up amongst all the jurisdictions. So everybody gets their share. And it's through the IFTA Clearinghouse that they do that, millions of dollars. So let's move on to how these carriers are collecting the distance and the methods they use. So let's consider these things. Let's ask the question of what makes up the IFTA distance? Does it include all the vehicles in the fleet? And are, are all the vehicles in a fleet included on an IFTA return? And what about rental vehicles? If you have rental vehicles in your fleet or, or local vehicles, like how, how does that, how does that, uh, how do those distances get taken into account? Well, drivers are hired to drive, yet they're inundated with paperwork. And I remember years ago, I remember uh, somebody saying to me, how many carriers got in, how many drivers got into driving truck because they liked paperwork? Not very many. And um, so the driver trip report, the DTR, was always the industry gold standard for, for years and years and years, like the, like the paper logbook, right? And it's still used by carriers to report IFTA, though that's rapidly changing with, um, with the adoption of GPS and ELD systems. So a traditional method, but you're really counting on the driver for accuracy. Auditors still like to see it. They really like paper. And, um, you, know, they're, you know, as much as industry has to learn about um, electronic data, the government has to too. And, and that's... That's a, that's a bit of a heavier hammer to swing, right? You can't change government. It's, uh, it takes a long, long time. And, um, you know, when I say that, that driver trip reports are all often uh, completed after the fact, you know, sitting in the truck stop after the fact, they make, it, it, it's, it's uh, creative accounting. Often information gets missed and, and reliability in terms of uh, time is, uh, is often, uh, questionable they they hand that in late i mean they're on the road so dispatch and routed distance so this is where um, companies take um you know some software like uh, pc miler or pro miles and they hook it to their dispatch system and then they calculate their ifta based on the dispatch distance so you know drivers I mean, they, they don't take the dispatch route. They, they go where they want to go. You know, I mean, they, they can be rerouted because of weather or traffic. Um, so it's not a really reliable or accurate way. Um, but companies often don't find that out until they're audited by government. And often it doesn't include um, uh, local distance or personal. I mean, once you, get, once you have an IFTA decal on your truck, you will report 100% of the distance in fuel. It doesn't matter if you take it on a vacation. You have to, you have to report 100% of the distance and fuel. And then you have to support all that by, um, by uh, other documentation in your company, bills of lading, you know, logs. Uh, but it's a, it's a highly error-prone way to collect distance for if you're reporting for the reasons that I've listed. Paper log books, there's still going to be some of them out there. There are very few exemptions, um, but, you know, they're, they're really not accurate for IFTA. They're, they're not accurate for ELDs either, but that's another whole story. And uh, they're really hard for administration to work with. Um, border crossings, you know, IFTA's distance by jurisdiction and, and 
EL and uh, logbooks aren't. And the record uh, keeping requirements for logbooks versus uh, IFTA and IRP, uh, portioned licensing, are totally different. You know, uh, record retention is six months for, for uh, logbooks, um, including ELDs, but you have to keep data up to 6.5 years for uh, IRP if you're going to use that. So over these last... I want to interject here, Sandy, for just a second. Yep. Yep. For just a second, Sandy. So if, if you're trying to use the daily record report of the driver as, as a basis yep. to all this, that data, yep. those, those instruments may be required six and a half years from now in an audit? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And it's no people. different than... Yeah, it, yeah, for an IRP audit, but it's no different than income tax, right? Like if, if let's say you had a, a medical receipt that you claimed on your income tax, and I think it's seven years actually for IRS, it is in Canada, it's uh, for Revenue Canada, it's seven years, and you have to keep that receipt because the government has the ability to go back for that far. Well, again, I'm, and that's the same I won't, for, I won't for electronic data. Yeah, for a lot of underwriters. But yeah, I mean, w the points that you bring up are, are right on line with the things that we're looking at. You know, what are they running for dispatched miles? What are they running for unladen? And you're saying all those count. And maybe they don't want to count them because they didn't enter, necessarily generate revenue. But ultimately, every every click on that odometer of a truck should somehow be registered, is what you're saying. Oh. Well, yeah, if, they're, if that's what you're going to use to report IFTA, then that's what you have to do. That's, mm -hmm. that's what you're signing. When you sign the, when you say, I want an IFTA license, you're agreeing to the terms of IFTA. You, it's a contract. Uh, Sandy and Rich, yeah. this is Tommy. I, yeah. This will stop a moment. So one of the things that I got from this so far is that when we ask for the IFTA miles, we need to ask, how are you figuring those miles? Are you using the the daily log books? Are you using GPS? Are you using points from zip code to zip code? Because that could vary as much as 10 or 15%. If you have a risk who's reporting it properly, all miles include vacation miles and service miles and all that, then their miles are going to go up more than someone who's reporting it just based on the driver uh, on the driver of uh, uh, daily reports. And so one thing that you just can't say, I want you to get the reports. I think what we have learned to this point, you need to ask them, what, how, are, how are the miles being reported? How are you accumulating the miles being reported on this report? Now, Aunt Sandy, yeah. um, just to let everybody know this, I suggested that I have said often that if those were being reported or audited by the federal government and therefore they're accurate, then Sandy laughed at me. So I also will back off of that statement too. <laughs> but but the point I'm the point I'm making here is that we need to. Uh, that's one of the questions, Rich. Don't you think we need we need to at least ask that, but so we know exactly what we're looking at. Because you compare one fleet with another fleet who's accumulating based on actual miles versus the daily miles, that could be as much as 10 or 15% difference. And we're trying to compare those two fleets. I agree. Yeah. And I know what there's two other big items control? that she's got coming up here that are that are also impacting us. So, right. yeah, if, if, if we're expecting to see X amount of miles in a fleet of this um, design, but if they're, if they're reporting, um, isn't comparable to others in their peer group, not to use a naughty word, but you know, if, if, if that's what we're expecting, why would there be variances? Right. And this helps us to see it. Okay. Thanks, Sandy. I just wanted to stop a minute here because I think this is real. And the other thing about the report, this is only when they're getting audited, uh, Rich, that they have that concern about keeping those records. But then how many, I assume those records could be kept electronically, can they not, Sandy? Yeah, it depends, like, uh, you know, scanning or whatever. Like, there are there are some definite, you'd have to go to the if to, uh, agreement to, to see all the different Means. Okay. Uh, needs and requirements. So, you know, okay. internal controls. What are the internal controls? How are you finding errors? How are you filling gaps? How are you doing those kinds of things? Internal controls. That's, that's what an auditor looks for. So, yeah. So just uh, and, uh, the next uh, one is GPS fleet management systems. Now, these are becoming more and more ubiquitous, and, and, and particularly with the ELDs. So with electronic um, uh, logging devices, ELDs, um, 
you know, even though it's a requirement, um, ELD vendors have the ability then to, to, to charge additional uh, uh, fees if they do an IFTA report. It's a really good marketing tool. Um, you know, the data, they're already collecting the data. Um, for them to create an IFTA return or a report, uh, first of all, um, you know, it's, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about ELDs, but GPS is accurate, but not perfect. And uh, vendors who have limited knowledge of IFTA are, you know, selling companies on the fact that they can use summary reports produced by fleet management systems to report IFTA. And they, I mean, that's that. On, uh, to have those uh, summary reports not backed up by the source data is not acceptable. So you have to have the original GPS data. And GPS is accurate and reliable, like I said, but not perfect. And you have to be able to check it for gaps and errors, right? Like, um, you know, it's a, it's a piece of hardware um, in, the, in the Ethernet, you know, like it's, it's there, there are problems. Um, and we find that we have to check uh, about 10% of the data and then about anywhere between 3 and 5% um, error rate. So you have to be able to fill in those gaps. <clears throat> and then again, storage. And if you are getting a two-minute ping for 100 trucks, that's, that's a huge, huge, huge amount of data. And vendors often don't understand the IFTA requirements. And small carriers have a limited knowledge and that ability to store that original raw data. And I don't know very many vendors who are really interested in keeping data for six and a half years. I mean, that's an expense. They don't want to do that. I was talking to a Rhode Island auditor one time, and he said that um, he audited a guy who had to go back to the GPS vendor to get the data, the original GPS data. And it was cheaper for him to pay for the audit than it was to pay the vendor to uh, get that distance, get the GPS readings. So here we are, here we are, uh, GPS from ELD systems. So it's the GPS, it's not the ELD data, it's the GPS tracking data from the truck. So ELD tracks the driver and IFTA wants to know where the truck went. You know, you could have a driver in multiple trucks in a day and if, and if, if that system, if that ELD system isn't really firing to, to, to know what vehicle that, that driver was in, um, that's a that's an issue because not all trucks need an ELD and not all drivers need an ELD. And smartphones, lots and lots of ELD vendors have smartphone apps and they're okay. But remember, when the phone isn't in the truck, the truck isn't being tracked. And again, we've got the record retention problem. And ELD vendors um, don't have the required IFTA knowledge. I, I saw an IFTA certification from a, a pretty prominent ELD vendor, and they misunderstood. They created their own certif certificate saying they were certified under IFTA and IRP, which that is non-existent, and they certified themselves under an old section that had been deleted and replaced. So they were certifying under section 600 and now it's a whole different, a whole different section. So you have to be, it's buyer beware, buyer beware, buyer beware. So the, um, the IFTA industry and, in, and IRP industry advisory committee members put together this little one pager talking about the distance data collection elements, um, what is required for ELDs and what is required for IFTA IRP compliance. And uh, I'm going to send Tommy a link to this, uh, so you'll be able to download it and give it to your customers uh, should you decide that you want to do that. It's a really handy dandy little tool. It's on the IFTA and IRP websites as well, uh, if you want to go on there uh, and get it. So there are other distance reporting methods, and this could be why distances are not actual. Um, believe it or not, companies will say, oh, we just estimate that. You know, it doesn't change very much month to month, so we just we just estimate the distance. 
Another one is the Household Goods Carriers Guide. And I think that's, Tommy refers to that quite often, um, you know, like you're in a mileage chart, right? And that, right. And that used to be how people did it. Sorry, Tommy, go ahead. No, it's, uh, you're right. Yeah, I refer to that part as a, a place to get the data. Yeah, or, you know, in the days when all the big carriers, right, like um, uh, before deregulation, so you'd have yellow and con, uh, consolidated freightways and, um, you know, all the, all the big carriers. They used the Household Goods Carrier Guide, and, and then they also had in-house mileage charts because they were pin to pin, right, like warehouse to warehouse. Um, so, th so they were using those and, um, but if it requires actual distance, I've seen my father take a, put a point on the map and point on the map and take one of those rollers that count the mileage and roll between those two points. That's why they wrote the miles down. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know how to track <laughs> this. Okay. Well, who's checking the accuracy of these IFTA returns? So like in context, IFTA reporting is on the honor system. And believe it or not, jurisdictions are only required to audit 3% of their carriers per year. Jurisdictions so, mean mainly uh, every state or the state or the Can Canadian province, right? That's what we're talking about, jurisdictions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, jurisdiction, any member, right? So, right. so uh, California has something like, uh, or what did I say? Uh, Pennsylvania has something like, I don't know, 30,000 IFTA licensees. You know, and Alberta has 3,000, you know. So if you have 30,000, you have to do three a year. That's, you know, 900, isn't that? Is that my math correct? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, uh, and then the jurisdictions actually get audited by their peers. They have a peer review every five years. But often the jurisdictions don't meet their audit quotas. So they get called up in front of the disputes. So ensuring insurers that you're getting what you need. So are you actually getting total distance? So the IFTA report will give you all the IFTA qualified vehicles, but what about all the vehicles that aren't reported under IFTA? So we deal with vehicles which don't qualify for IFTA, but carriers apportion them for a number of reasons. So, and that's light duty vehicles as well not just heavy duty vehicles, but light duty, and they'll apportion them because in many juris in many states in particular, um, uh, vehicles that are apportioned become sales tax exempt. Uh, Sandy, let me stop for a minute. Just you're using terminology. I just want to make sure everybody follows. Uh, if the requirement is any vehicle 26,000 GVW or larger, that's used in interstate commerce, meaning cross state lines. And then as Sandy says, they track the number of miles they travel in each jurisdiction and the amount of fuel they come up with average miles per gallon. And they figure how much fuel was purchased or needed to travel those distances. And that's where the tax is distributed. distributed. The a portion she's talking about is the portion tag, the international registration plan. And we're familiar with that on the front of the truck. That's also a portion, basically the same thing with tax distribution, where it's the, the fee is not based on where the tag is purchased, like the state. The fee is based on where the miles are traveled in the next year that the tag is going to be good for. And the insured tells the state that they're going to spend X miles in California, X miles in Nevada, X miles in New Mexico, X miles in Phoenix. And then the percentage of the miles in each one develops the, pre the tax fee, the license plate fee. And that's subject to any vehicle, 10,001 GBW. And Sandy is suggesting here is that some vehicles, even less than 10,001 GBW, might be a portion because of some jurisdictions, if you're part of interstate commerce, you're not subject to uh, some, some uh, sales tax uh, requirements. And so what we're here in this place that Rich and I talked about, because he does a lot of work with the last mile delivery, we have a number of units that, uh, that a motor carrier could have where the GVW is less than 26,000 GVW, that would be a portion tags. And if they're used for commerce, we would want to try to develop premium for that. That would not be reported on IFTA. That's what we're talking about here, uh, Sandy. I just want to clarify those terminologies. Yeah, and uh, hot shot, anything like that, right? Hot shot, right. pilot cars. Right, yes. Like that kind of stuff, right? So those, yes. those and, and, and oftentimes they'll just apportion them because it makes it easier for law enforcement to... 
right? Like they just, they don't want to, they don't want to be held up. So right. yeah, got a tag, got an apportioned tag on it. You bet. Right. He's, we got our fees, you know? And, and Rich, that's important in your business, right? Definitely. And as Sandy said, there's other elements that, um, uh, heavy haulers for their pilots and things like that. I mean, what you're saying is right. And you can't necessarily always look at an IFTA as Sandy's going to explain to us, you know, the merits of the IRP. And, and, uh, yeah. you said it before, Tommy, this is, this is where I intend to be operating, you know, and that's my anticipation for my taxation purpose. Okay. Well, it's, 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 it's always, Apportionment is always in arrears. It's always, you always base it like insurance. You base on where you went the last 12 months, right? Like if the uh, IRP distance runs in a year from July to June, but the, the same as the heavy vehicle use tax, the, the excise tax form 2290. So it's July to June. So if you, if you have a fleet that is uh, January 1st, 2018, the distance that you are going to use for your apportionment is from July 1st, 2016 to June 30th, 2017. And, and, and that's, that's the standard, right? Like that's how, uh, that's all, how all IRP fleets are calculated, written in stone. And that's why it's six and a half years because, you know, if you're January and you get January 2018, you're already six months like your distance is already 18 months old, right? Right. Right. So anyway, so apportionment, that was good. Uh, thanks for doing that, Tommy. Thanks for clarifying that. So how about rental and leased vehicles? So IFTA allows for either the lessee or the lessor to report IFTA, but because the rental plate or the leased vehicles plate is typically in the name of the rental leasing company, then that distance belongs to the plate. So there's a disconnect right there. The carrier may report the IFTA, but the rental company has to report the, the um, IRP portion because they own the plate. So chances are that the company is not separating, if they're reporting IFTA, then, then they're not separating out the IRP distance. They'll just lump that right in, even though they don't have that vehicle or a plate on that vehicle. So there's another reason why distances get out of whack. And as well with owner operators, you know, an owner operator might is, might have his own plate, but, but the car he might run the carrier Zifta. Or so let's say Landstar or somebody like that, right? Owner operators. We're finding typically, Sandy, it's just the opposite of that, that a lot of times the fleet buys the portion tag because it's based on the DOT number, where the, but they allow the owner operator to be a part of the uh, IFTA reporting. And then as, our, as underwriting, we have difficulty getting the IFTA reports. As also, sometimes our insurers are renting trucks, for example, Rider, and Rider provides the IFTA miles. Uh, reporting, and we can't get all the, the, the Rider IFTA miles report for our insurance. So yep. this becomes a, a situation. And, and I think, you know, I've said, and in, in last time we just did this webinar or something I brought up that I have a problem with the owner operators having their own IFTA account, but you reminded me that sometimes there could be a problem here because going back to the difference in California and Nevada, if that owner operator bought all their fuel in Nevada and the motor carrier included the owner operators miles in their report, then that motor carrier, if they spend miles in California, might owe California money based on where the owner operator uh, uh, operated, and that owner operator could leave. And how are they going to recover that? Uh, as also, you yeah, also have, you yeah. also have the problem is miles per gallon. Sometimes the owner yeah. operator gets more or less miles per gallon than the fleet does. And that will, and if you have a lot of that, that could change the calculations on the miles per gallon that's used as a part of the formula. Therefore, the fleet would pay miles that are taxes on the, that were derived by the owner operator's operation that wasn't theirs, and yet they can't collect that from the owner operator. 
Well, how, what happens is, is that IFTA is reported on fleet consumption. So if, if you have a mix of vehicles, right, and you have guys who speed and burn a lot of fuel, and then you have guys who operate more efficiently, the efficient operators are actually being penalized by the guys who operate less efficient, efficiently. So the fleet MPG might be five. But you okay. might have a guy getting 6.5, but he still has his IFTA calculated on five, even though he's doing everything right. So he wants to have his own IFTA, and that's why. If so, he understands it, he understands how it works. Well, if fleets understand this, it's, 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 a, it's a major concern. And even then you get in the question, if you make them only fuel up at certain fuel stations and certain stations and all that, yeah. now you end up break and then maybe they're an employer or not. That's a, that's a, that's the concern to that. But we are finding that it's often the the fleet does allow the owner operator to have their own if account. Rich, do you run into that in the underwriting you're doing? Yes, I do run into that and Sandy's points well taken and again without getting into their financials. Like you said, the contractor could be running across some less expensive, let's just say Midwestern states, but that fleet has a whole bunch of California miles yep. and, and they've got lower fuel mileage. So he's getting a double whammy. But yes, we we are challenged with rental people. You know, where where are those miles being reported if we can't get to them? Uh, sometimes they are difficult to get out of the lessor providers. And then the same thing, if the owner operators are having them, how difficult is it for us to get it at that level? So. Be aware, agents and underwriters. I mean, sometimes you, in a perfect world, you'd have it all. And if you can't, just understand why, you know, there's 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 this disparity, you know, and there's inability to fill in the gaps sometimes. And it goes yeah. back again, you can't just ask for the if the reports without asking first, how are those miles accumulated and who accumulates them? Because we'll be missing yeah. some if, if we do that, and, and particularly if they have delivery trucks, use on operators, or as we talked about before, there's a difference between using the moving storage rates versus the actual rates versus the driver log rates. And so once, when we look at if the reports, we've got to understand how those reports are accumulated to get a fair measurement of the exposure of the miles traveled by all the units we're insuring. That's right which is a perfect segue into my next slide. Why should we care? We didn't even plan that. So effect, So if, if you don't have uh, the right distance, it, it, it affects either the insurer or the insured, or both. So how do insurers get what they need? Well, you're taking the first step today because you're here, you're learning something, knowledge is king. And to help your customer understand what they need is you need to understand what you need from them. And, you're, and you have to know that you may or may not be getting correct or complete IFTA data. And the, the, I think the number one reason is, is because carriers don't really understand <laughs> whether they don't know what they don't know. They, they don't even, they're not even sure if they're reporting right. They, it, it, it's, it's not easy. It seems easy on the surface, but it's not. Uh, and then Sandy, with, uh, Sandy yeah. I am very anal about defining, defining it. Are you talking about motor carriers or insurance carriers? In this case, we're talking about both. So motor carriers oh. would, be, would be for both insurance, insurance carriers and motor carriers. We have to typically say, even though here you're probably talking about motor carriers, but the insurance carriers also don't understand this. Yeah, so that's so right. both types of carriers have this problem. Well, and, and, and then really vendors who are selling things to carriers. I mean, you know, if you go and you want to buy a phone, you're, you're, you're counting on that provider knowing what he's talking about. And ELD vendors want to sell a product. And some of them might have a good understanding of IFTA, but my, in my experience, it is limited. And based on, you know, a lot of the stories I've heard and, and, um, um, and also, um, you know, even just GPS fleet management systems, the vendors, the vendors are really, there are a limited number of vendors who really understand um, government reporting and the requirements. We don't do much on ELDs. 
Uh, I haven't done a lot of reports on that because of the mandate and things like that, but, but this is why it's critical right now. Uh, as of October, uh, uh, December 18th, obviously everybody knows the ELDs are now being required. So motor carriers who are using uh, and reported if this prior to October 10th, or excuse me, December 18th, base their miles on something else. Now they're putting electronic log devices in their trucks and some of these electronic devices, vendors are saying, look, we can not only make sure you're in compliance with hours of service, save that, but we can also give you some additional data. In fact, I've had many vendors on programs we have put out to say, don't just buy the cheap ELD because they can offer you a whole lot more than just tracking the hours of service and you can get more benefit out of it. And so now the problem that you're going to find, particularly if you insure a fleet, particularly if that fleet is based on uh, miles, on if those miles, and if that fleet previous did not have electronic log devices or GPS data tracking the miles and who are now using those electronic log devices, GPS tracking miles as a part of the if the report, you're going to end up with a 10 or 15 percent additional miles per unit or so that yet the unit's not traveling any more miles than it did before. Well, it may or may not. Like well, it just okay. depends. Right. Okay. I you don't, all right. Either, okay. They're not, there could be different miles. I'll just put it that way. Yes. Yeah. Different miles. Yeah. So, so part of this is to say insurers, you know, it's good that you're here because you're getting an education to understand what it is you're asking for. And then you're going to be able to help educate your customers to get, to help them get you what you need. And I think the big message here is let your customers know that, that it's truly buyer beware for ELDs. I'll give you an example. I had a, a Canadian carrier. They, they called me, uh, one of my customers, and they said, hey, we bought an ELD. And when we were hooking it up, it asked for a U.S. license plate. And they said they don't have a U.S. license plate. They have a Canadian Alberta license plate. And the vendor said to them, just make one up. <laughs> this was a name that you would be very, very familiar with. And um, so they told them to just make one up. So you can't, you know, it's buyer beware. And and there are, I don't know, last time I counted, there were something like 142 vendors. Like it's ridiculous. And um, they may or may not be good systems. And as you, you know, say, all, most, they're also self-certified too with no policing yeah. yet. Yeah. Well, and that's when I talked to the FMCSA, they said, oh, no, we're going to let the industry figure that out. So, so what are you going to do? Well, you can recommend to your customers that they outsource, that they take, that they take, you know, they give their uh, a service bureau, someone like me, there's, there's a whole list of, uh, of um, transportation services uh, companies and NASA, and I put the wrong uh, uh, website. So, website, it's NASA.info, not org, and NASA.info. And there's a whole list that you can recommend your uh, your uh, customers to to help them use that ELD data for IFTA in the right way. Now, that being said, there are some uh, service providers who understand GPS data better than others. So you have to be careful there too. Again, it's buyer beware. Or maybe you've got people who want to do it in-house, right? Um, Maybe they don't have the right software. Well, we have some software that we sell. Uh, it's called the OFTS, very, very clever name, online field tech software. We're not, that, we're not that clever when it comes to naming things. And then they can get some education from MIFTA and IRP, and there's the websites. And uh, we're coming out with a GPS checking software that's going to be uh, web-based uh, sometime this year. Uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, where you'd be able to take your ELD data, find the uh, gaps and errors in it, uh, run it through our program, and come up with a distance by jurisdiction summary that you'd be able to use for IFTA. Sandy, that's... Uh, yep. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, so here's another thing that you can do. Here's some tools for you. 
Um, we made up a seven question survey to help IFTA licensees assess their level of knowledge. So if you go to www.fleettaxpro.com and have your carriers take the IFTA challenge it and it rates them, it will tell them, um, you know, boy, are you, are you a fleet tax pro? Are you a journeyman? Are you a greenhorn? It tells them, uh, it's a quick way for them to assess their level of knowledge. And if this is something that's of interest and, and could take off for you or give you, give you some comfort, we could tailor it um, to the insurance industry concerns. This would be something worthwhile. And, and, yeah. and the reason this comes to light, we're doing programs right now. In fact, we're recording some things in this new Truckers U that we're going to be up, up and available on July 1st. And we're talking about the requirements of insurance carriers requiring IFTA, and today most of them do the last quarter, but they require them and they look at them, but they don't know what they're based on and they don't know if they're accurate or not. They don't know the differences or not. So I asked Sandy and with Rich's help today to go through this. And so things like this, uh, remember early on some of the programs we did, we asked them, did you know the facts about CSA? And most of those failed. Same thing here. If you're going to have and base your underwriting and your premium on the IFTA reports, then you need to understand, do the insureds report IFTA in a proper manner? If not, why not? And if not, what differences it make in your underwriting uh, and also pricing your risk? And that's the point we're making here. And Sandy is offering her services and her knowledge, like we have a lot of our vendors who are no trucking, who specialize in trucking, who've taken time to also learn how their product affects the insurance industry and the Motor Carriers and Such Education Foundation tries to bring these kind of people to you uh, as far as our members. Rich, you want to say something also in closing? I will say that uh, I'm not a tax pro. I will say that uh, constantly watching and reading the information from Sandy is, is helpful. It's not a perfect world. We have to use discretion. You know, we are underwriters and we have to discriminate. So we have to look at the information that's available and, and hopefully be able to turn to people like her. Specifically, we know we can come to her because she has experience and knowledge in this area. And it's difficult, I know, as a agent to reach out and try to get if to information, sometimes trying to do that on behalf of your customer. And I hope that we've revealed, you know, some of the challenges that lie before it. And I think we all have to come to some agreement at a point in time that I have adequate information, never going to be perfect. And we continue to look at the information that Sandy gives to us here and in, in identifying, you know, where is our comfort level? So I love this, Sandy. Cover your, yeah, cover your assets, Sandy. Close with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what we'll do too is you can, uh, we'll look at uh, companies' internal controls. We'll, we'll tell them very quickly if we think that their data would pass an IFTA audit. So in other words, are they collecting all their distance? Are they reporting all their distance? And are they doing, you know, do they, are they putting vehicles that aren't qualified in their fleet or are they missing vehicles or whatever? So we'll do that and um, I'll send, uh, I'm going to send uh, Tommy a, a, a link uh, to this. And if you think this is something that uh, would benefit you as an insurer to make sure that you're getting what you need, um, it's, a, it's a, a, a good way to have a look at um, uh, at that and for, for carriers to feel confident that they're reporting their IFTA correctly. Oh. So that's it for me, Tommy and Rich. And uh, so I'm going to say, uh, ask if there's any questions. And, um, you know, uh, my contact information, North Star Fleet, you can go to my website, um, www.northstarfleet.com. And, and you can follow me on LinkedIn. If there's some articles that uh, there's lots of articles that I post that would be helpful to your customers. For everybody, this I've been, I've been this webinar. I've been trying to watch for chats, and so I don't see any. And I, I just want to say thank you to the 180 plus people that attended today. That was awesome. <laughs> A loss. I personally, want to thank you. I personally, want to thank you, Sandy, for the time. And if Rich, there were questions, I, oh, well, we thanks so much them, for I having apologize. me on. It was uh, great I'll, to be able to share some knowledge. 
I also want to remind them that this these webinars will be posted uh, in the next week or so on the uh, Motor Carriers Insurance Education website under the truck stop if you want to replay them for your insurers. And we'll also will forward everybody through our office. Beth will do that, all the information that Sandy will provide uh, for us. We hope you got something out of this uh, almost hour you spent with us today so that you can take better care of your insureds, motor carriers, and bring valuable, valuable information to them and do a better job of lending insurance to them. We do these truck stops every uh Second Thursday, the, excuse me, the, yeah, the second Thursday of every month at 2 p.m. We'll look forward to the one next month, which will be February 8th, 2018, uh, at 2 p.m. We hope you all have a good week, and uh, we look forward to uh, being having you all involved in the foundation. Thank you.